colleagues are. Maybe they didn't want to review. Of course, the first part of this is not a review. We still need to talk about something I've been saying all along, and that is psychoactive drugs produce their effects by altering one or more steps of the synapse, or the, the, one or more steps in uh, synaptic transmission, which is what the first sentence of this slide refers to. That is the basis of almost all actions of psychoactive drugs. And uh, as we go through this, we're going to be referring to this diagram, but this diagram that I have on the slide doesn't have the labels that the diagram on page 93 has. So if you'll refer to the diagram in the book as we go through this discussion, um, I'm just going to use some slides to identify some of the ways in which drugs can alter synaptic transmission in order to produce their effects. In some cases, I will give specific examples of these different processes. In other cases, I won't. What you'll need to be responsible for on the test are the ones that I specifically refer to. Because I don't expect you to memorize, nor is a need to memorize, all of the examples they give, unless Cheyenne, you just want to. If you want to know that alpha methyl tyrosine inhibits tyrosine hydroxylase, go for yes. it. Okay. And Abby, if you want to know that parachlorophenylalanine inhibits tryptophan hydroxylase, that's your baby. What I do want you to know <laughs> is that for, if you notice, let's go back, let's back up one. Yep, let's back up two. Okay, the very first one that it labels on your diagram, and there are 11 of them. This is not necessarily an exhaustive list, but it's a pretty, pretty complete list in terms of a, a potential way that a drug can alter synaptic transmission. One is a drug can be a neurotransmitter precursor. It can increase the rate of synthesis. By precursor, it means it's a substance from which a neurotransmitter is synthesized. Now, here's one particular example I will give you. Notice on the slide it talks about L-dopa, which is a precursor to dopamine. So, in other words, somewhere along the synthetic pathway, L-dopa will be converted into dopamine. Now, one of the reasons I bring this up is that in the past, and to some extent still today, in people with Parkinson's disease, one of the treatments is to give them injections of L-dopa. Now, if you remember, Parkinson's disease is a disruption of dopamine pathways. And there's, there's not enough activity in the dopamine pathways, and that produces problems. So by giving L-DOPA, you can uh, get it into the brain where it can be synthesized into dopamine to increase the levels of dopamine that are available to be used. Now, one question I would have if somebody told me that, although I already know the answer, is why inject L-DOPA if, why not just inject dopamine? that occur to you, Cheyenne? Why do you, does anybody have any idea why they don't inject dopamine? And it's a good example of something I talked about earlier, actually back in chapter one. Would it be like over-stimulation of the um, actually, you wouldn't get any increase in dopamine activity in the brain if you injected dopamine. wonder why that is. 
think you would. Okay, I can tell you can't wait any longer, can you, Abby? Dopamine won't cross the blood-brain barrier. So if you inject it systemically, it's never going to get to the brain. The only way you could administer that would be to inject it directly into the brain, which isn't a particularly good idea with humans. <coughs> so they give L-dopa, which will cross the blood-brain barrier, and then let the brain synthesize the dopamine. Okay, so that's one way. A second way is that the drug inhibits enzyme for synthesis of neurotransmitter and reduces the levels of the neurotransmitter. Because, as you know, the neurotransmitters are synthesized either in the axon terminals or in the cell body. And there are enzymes that are necessary for this synthesis to take place. If you inhibit those uh, enzymes, then what you're going to do is um, reduce the amount of neurotransmitter that's available. And when you're looking at that diagram, pay attention to the plus signs and the minus signs in green and red, because that in, those circles indicate that if it's green, it's an agonist. If it's uh, red, it's an antagonist. Okay? Okay, number three. And I was telling them, Kyla, you don't have to no specific examples of each of these unless I specifically point them out. But like I told them, if you want to memorize those two that are there, go right ahead. Apparently not. <laughs> okay. A drug blocks the enzyme involved in neurotransmitter breakdown. Well, if it does that, if you inhibit the enzyme that metabolizes the neurotransmitter, then the end result is you're going to have more, the neurotransmitter is going to be around longer than normal. Therefore, you're going to have an enhanced effect or um, you're going to have a situ situation in which you're going to have an agonist effect. And again, these are not two examples you're responsible for. Although, just, just think for a minute, let's, let's do this. You're not responsible for it on a test question, but I want, here's a good thought question. Physostigmine blocks acetylcholine esterase, which breaks down acetylcholine. Okay, so if you block the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine, what's that going to do to the levels of acetylcholine? going to keep them around longer than normal, right? Maybe even increase the amount of acetylcholine that's normally present. Okay, now, what, where do you find acetylcholine in terms of synapses in the nervous system? You find it in the brain, Kyla? There's the one I'm really looking for is neuromuscular junctions. Okay, now think about this. If you've got acetylcholine operating at all neuromuscular junctions, and you increase the, act, the level of the activity of that neurotransmitter, what's going to happen to the muscle? more than normal or less than normal? Mm -hmm. Well, acetylcholine causes muscle contraction when it's released. So if you've got higher levels of it, the muscles are going to be, yeah, more. 
Okay. Now the next question is, is that a good thing? Probably not. No. In fact, you get it high enough, you're going to get more or less constant contraction, state of tetanus. What could that mean? You're going to get much, way too high levels of muscular contraction in the body. But in particular, think about a location that you don't want sustained contraction, and that would be the diaphragm, which, right, which is the major muscle for breathing. If it's constantly contracting, are you going to breathe normally? No. It could kill you. And that's how some of the nerve gases that are used in warfare work. They actually cause acetylcholine to do those kinds of things. You could also produce death, though, if you administered a drug that antagonized acetylcholine, and therefore it didn't produce contractions, therefore you could die. Okay. Drug blocks uh, transporters for neurotransmitter uptake. Remember, one way of deactivating a neurotransmitter is through reuptake. If you block the transporters that pull it back up into the cell, then what you're going to have is elevated levels of activity of that particular neurotransmitter. And that can produce dramatic results. For example, and these are two I do want you to to, th to be responsible for. Cocaine blocks the transmitters primarily for dopamine. It does have some effect on norepinephrine and serotonin, but it's the blockade of the reuptake of dopamine that primarily underlies all the effects asso associated with cocaine. So if you think about that, that had, that's pretty dramatic. You can have pretty dramatic effects just by a very specific action on a particular neurotransmitter mechanism. And another classic example of blocking reuptake are certain types of antidepressants which block the transporters for serotonin. And a classic example of those would be the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor like Prozac. So here's two good examples of effects that can be produced by blocking reuptake of a neurotransmitter. And those are two I expect you to remember. Okay, the drug blocks storage of the neurotransmitter in synaptic vessels. You don't have to remember this example, but think what happens would happen as a result of that. If you can't store, or if you're having problems storing the neurotransmitter in the synaptic vesicles, that means you're not going to have it available for use. Therefore, you're going to have an antagonistic effect. A drug stimulates release of a neurotransmitter by reversing action of uptake transporters. Just think about this as increasing the release of the neurotransmitter. And, and here's an example I want you to know. Not both of them, but one of them. Amphetamine. It stimulates the release of dopamine and norepinephrine. It actually blocks the reuptake of both of those as well. So if you're stimulating the release, you're putting more out there in the synapse than normal. You block the reuptake, you're having a, the same effect, so you get a double whammy when you take amphetamine. And that underlies most of the effects typically associated with amphetamine. You ever seen some of these pictures of people before and after years of amphetamine use? It's pretty dramatic and it's pretty sad. Not, um, 
I hate to admit it, but I am old enough to remember back in the 60s and 70s during the uh, hippie generation and a time period in our history when drug use was uh, pretty widespread. But in the drug culture, people who used amphetamine or methamphetamine were often referred to as speed freaks. And the, the speed just referred to the drug, but the freaks referred to the fact that even in the drug culture, they were considered to be low men on the totem pole. I mean, they were, they often had paranoid symptoms, they often acted very bizarre, they often looked very emaciated, and they were often just viewed as parasites within the drug culture. And to some extent, they would be viewed that way today. I just don't think that term is used much today. Okay, you've got drug stimulating or inhibiting autoreceptors. Well, I haven't even mentioned what the heck an autoreceptor is, have I? These are receptors that are found on your car. Getting autoreceptors. <laughs> So when you're driving down the highway and you encounter these drug molecules, they're biting into your car. You didn't know that, did you, Abby? I didn't. You look out for those things. Okay. Okay. Now, an autoreceptor, now the receptors we've talked about so far are receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. Well, there are receptors found on the presynaptic membrane as well. And those are the autoreceptors that this is referring to. And when you stimulate or inhibit those autoreceptors, then the, the effect that's going to have is either to increase or decrease the amount of neurotransmitter being released by that cell. And you don't need to worry about clonidine or 8-OH-DPAP or yohimb or pendulum. Don't worry about the drug acts on postsynaptic receptors, which is what we typically think about. An agonist mimics a neurotransmitter effect on a receptor. An antagonist inhibits the effect of the neurotransmitter on the receptor. Heroin is an agonist because it binds to opioid receptors in the brain, so does morphine. Nicotine binds to a cholinergic receptors. THC, what's THC? Yeah. It's the act, primary active ingredient, in, well actually, to be more accurate, the primary active ingredient in marijuana is Delta-9 THC. But they produce their effects by mimicking the effects of naturally occurring neurotransmitters. An antagonist, on the other hand, inhibits the effect of the neurotransmitter. Did you know caffeine is an antagonist? Now you would think, now think about that for a minute. If caffeine, why do we consume caffeine most of the time? Keep you alert? Yeah, keep you alert. Wake you up. You know, a little bit of stimulation. <clears throat> so if it's stimulating the nervous system, I wonder how it would do that if it's inhibiting a neurotransmitter. You know, face on the surface that doesn't sound right. But here's what's happening. With in the body there is a, a chemical, or in the brain, there's a chemical called Adenosine, A-D-E-N-O-S-I-N-E. -E. And over the, the period of a day, adenosine accumulates in the brain. And one of the effects of, of raising adenosine levels is that you tend to become drowsy. Caffeine antagonizes adenosine or blocks that adenosine. So that's how it produces a stimulant effect. 
And an example of an antagonist would be some of the drugs that are used to treat schizophrenia. They antagonize dopamine receptors, a particular type of dopamine receptor, which is called the D2 receptor. So I would expect you to know that heroin, morphine, nicotine, THC are example of receptor agonists, that caffeine and some of the neuroleptic drugs are examples of receptor antagonists. Okay, let's see, did we cover all of them? Neurotransmitter precursor, synthesis, storage, stimulates release, and inhibits release. I don't know if we hit that one or not. But it's just, if a drug inhibits the release of a neurotransmitter, that means a not enough of it's going to be released enough to have a strong enough act and therefore it's antagonistic. Stimulates postsynaptic receptors, blocks postsynaptic receptors. So I don't think there's any more on here related to that than there are. If it blocks the postsynaptic receptor, what's going to happen there? It's going to bind to the receptor and therefore occupy the receptor so that the neurotransmitter can't bind to it. And what that often will happen is the, um, the drug will maybe not produce any effects on its own, 